Hello and welcome to everyone listening to the Written and Melanin podcast, the place where you come to get your weekly dose of melanated creativity. I'm your host, CM Lockhart, an author of fantasy books featuring black girls who aren't all that nice and the owner of the Melanin Library, an online database of books written by black authors. And in this space, I share with you everything I've learned on my journey as a black and indie author. I'm glad you're here. And today, you guys, I have Tatiana O.B. joining me for this episode of the Written and Melanin podcast. Tatiana writes badass characters slaying dragons. She is the author of A Forging of Age Duology, and she enjoys combining action with character-driven stories that features diverse heroes and heroines. Her debut novel, Bones to the Wind, is a 2022 BBA award winner and a 2022 Indie Inc. award finalist. She once taught English in South Korea, studied abroad in Japan, and worked as a marketing specialist for a woman-owned law firm. The one thing she loves as much as writing is traveling the world, and she is joining me today to discuss her upcoming release, Sister Samurai, and share with us some knowledge about writing short stories and understanding the different genres there are. Welcome to the podcast, Tatiana. Thank you for having me, Chelsea. Absolutely. I am so excited. So... For those of you who are listening to this now or in the future, I need you guys to know that while this is Tatiana's first time on the podcast, this is not my first time talking to her. And honestly, y'all, this is one of the people in like my sphere who are like, when I talk about like, oh, there are people who know Chelsea and there are people who know like CM Lockhart. She knows Chelsea and I love her so much for it. Well, I'm glad to be able to claim that you also know Tatiana as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So she is one of the members of the author council, the council that I put together of like authors earlier this year that I talked to you guys about. I will leave the link to the YouTube video where I talked about that. But that being said, Tatiana, let's introduce you to our listeners. So tell us a little bit more about both, all of your books, not both, but all of them. So A Forging of Age Duology and Sister Samurai. Sure. So my duology is made up of Bones to the Wind and Dragon Your Bones. Here are the two books. And And they're gorgeous. Oh, thank you. (laughs) It is a basically a coming of age competition. So think Hunger Games with wind ships and dragons. And um, it's just an adventure. (laughs) And the upcoming novella that I have coming out, which is the ebook and paperback will be released on November 1st, is Mm -hmm. Sister Samurai. So it's an homage to the anime Afro Samurai. And it is just an action fantasy novella, just pure black action heroine. All the good stuff. And I can vouch definitely for sure for Sister Samurai because I have read it and I was just like, yo, this is so good. And I'm also currently reading uh, Bones to the Wind uh-huh. and I am having so much fun with it because I'm one of those people where like I'll start reading something and I'll get literally 4% into the book. I'll get past like the first two chapters and I'll be like, mm, my attention span's not there anymore. <laughs> but... I have been like on a regular basis, been like making my way through your book. And so when you say that you really write like action packed stories, like from the very beginning, stuff is popping off, stuff is happening. Yeah, yeah. I, and you know, what's hilarious when I gave it to my beta readers, the first, the first series, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I don't, it's, I'm sorry if it's kind of slow or if it seems kind of slow. And they all came back to me they're like, Tatiana. There's so much action in this. I'm like, really? I thought I needed more action scenes. I'm glad. Slow wear. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So for those of you listening to the podcast, we do have a chat up. So if you'd like to join the backstage in the future, sign up for our Patreon so you can have access to that link. But La and Audra are here. And La was like, slow? No way. <laughs> Where? Not possible. So... If you guys are into black epic fantasy, is it is it epic fantasy? So I would personally consider like the Forging of Age more sword and sorcery adventure um, story. Okay. And then Sister Samurai will be more action fantasy. So I wouldn't really consider them epic fantasy. Okay. And I want you guys to know that I am actually super hella organized for this podcast episode because I knew that I wanted to talk to her about this. So we are going to be covering specifically different genres, especially with the fantasy within the fantasy genre later on in the podcast. But before we get into that, I kind of wanted to focus on your writing and everything about that because the thing about being an indie author is like there's so much work that has to go into it. 
And it's one of those things where there are people who do it, and then there are people who do it well. And I like to consider us among people who do it well. <laughs> you know? And I feel like there's so much knowledge that has to be gained where it's just like lived experience, right? So that being said, especially focusing on a sister samurai, because that's what's coming up. And y'all know there'll be a link in the description box or the show notes, wherever you're watching this at. So you can go ahead and pre-order sister samurai or get your copy if it's already out, depending on when you're watching slash listening to this. But um, what has been your experience like as an indie author and like putting your own books out there in the world? I say terrifying, but you know, <laughs> that comes from someone who is definitely an introvert. Like, you know, just putting yourself out there on social media, it's not easy. Like, it's not putting a story out there isn't easy. But I also went into this endeavor with the intentions to share my stories. Because you know, even though I just published last year, I've been writing for a long, long time. <laughs> I've probably been writing since I've been, a, I've been a little girl. I've written several books. But it was really the pandemic that kind of influenced me. You know what, Tatiana, you should get these stories out there. You, you know, tomorrow's not promised. So I wanted, I wanted to share my story. So, you know, obviously sharing your stories is, you know, putting yourself, <laughs> putting yourself out there. You want people yep. to read them. Because I do want, at the end of the day, a lot of the books that I write is to fill those representational holes that's in the genre. I feel mm -hmm. as if they are needed. And I feel as if I'm not the only one who needs them. So um, agreed. You know, it is important to share them, put them out there, because for a lot of us, you don't see these things. One of the reasons why I wrote Bones to the Wind is because the protagonist Raja, I wanted an unapologetic, badass female character. And yes. Usually, when you see that in fantasy, they're all like, "Oh, you know, like I'm, I, you know, like they they apologize for their greatness." Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, "You don't have to do that. Just go. You know, like like just... like get it. Like, why can't <laughs> women be ambitious? Why can't women want glory? Why can't you know women want all the things? And so it's just like, I gotta write it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love that, and it's part of the reason that I was drawn to your book and your brand and like everything about your atmosphere in the first place because it on a fundamental level like so just so much aligned with what I wanted to see and what I wanted to have where it's just like no we're not apologizing for like you said having ambition for being great and like literally the first chapter because the thing is like when we met initially, like before I even knew you, I had already read the sample of Bones to the Wind. And in the sample, Raja is taking the bones and like yeeting them as far as she possibly can. And I'm just like, wow. Okay. We're already from the jump just being the most. And I love it. And she's like, and she has this energy of like, okay because people are like do you know who he is like you need to calm down and she's like do you know who I am like y'all need to chill out I am not you are not about to force humble me and this is chapter one and I'm like I love it I love it already exactly <laughs> so much. yeah but you know and that's also I think like how we connect it too because even like mm -hmm. your books and your tagline like you know like I write um, black characters who aren't all that nice I'm just mm -hmm. like yes <laughs> <laughs> Yes, give me some some of that. So it's just like, I think it just clicked real well. We're just like, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. We've been talking about, you know, your duology, which is like the full length novels yeah. and the series, which is completely different from writing <laughs> a short story. So how, like, what was that like? Because I feel like as authors, sometimes we go into it like, oh, surely if I can write a hundred, 150,000 word novel, I can knock out like a 5,000 word story, like it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I honestly struggle with short form works. Like, because as I said, I've kind of have written books before. And I know mm -hmm. that my natural length is about 260,000 words. Like that on the very, very long end. And my novella was supposed to be a short story. Initially, was a short <laughs> story. So, obviously that didn't work out. <laughs> I love how you're like, oh, what's only supposed to be like 5,000 words is it actually right under a 40,000 word novel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's right there at like 32,000 words. Because I, I had initially gotten the idea of this story. I was looking, there was an anthology I was going to submit to, and it was a short story. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? 
this idea is really good. I'm going to keep this one for myself and have it percolating in my brain. And mm-hmm. at least with this novel, it like one there was one day where it kind of all came to me, like the whole plot structure, what it was going to be. And so I had a very clear vision of what this specific novel novella was going to be. And it's a mm-hmm. little bit easier because when I say it popped in my brain, it was more like a TV episode, like that kind of like short contained stories. But yeah. with novels, I would say they're more like movies, right? There's interlocking mm-hmm. plot lines. There's, you know, subplots. There's all these things. So there's a lot more to keep track of with novels. And also novellas is very hard, too, because you have to get across, you know, very important items, character characterization of the world building in a very short time period. Um, yes. And that can come with its, with its struggles and challenges as well. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you touched on that because I talked about it a little bit when I was trying to submit for the Stygian collection, where it's just like, it's a completely different beast, but like you touched on it exactly. It's okay. You have to put all of these things that show up in a long form novel where you have time and space to kind of introduce things over time and you have to condense it and you have to put all those same things into a much, much, much smaller word count. And it's just like, okay, this is this is a completely different skill. That's why I say it's a completely different skill to write short stories versus long series versus even writing children's books because that in and of itself is also a completely different beast that we are not going to touch on in this podcast episode. But it is completely different from writing short stories even. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. Even when, you know, a lot of the um, advice when writing a novel is go read, go read novels. And that's kind of mm-hmm. the same with short stories. Go read short stories. Like yes. see how they are structured. See how, like just really read short stories and tear them apart. It's very helpful for your own short story writing. Absolutely. Again, one of my favorite short story collections right now is Africa Risen mm-hmm. because it's just one, it's um, authors that I have never read before. Um, so it's exposing me to new types of writing, but also that short story format, it kind of seeing it done well is completely different from seeing it done at all, I think. Yeah. And I think a lot of us have seen it done before, but not necessarily have seen it done well. And so picking those examples of what you're going to like look at and take from it is like super important because I also read what is A Phoenix First Must Burn, that anthology. Not not going to say it was bad, but reading them side by side, I was like, oh, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be like, oh, as an author, I want to learn from one of these two. I was like, I'm, I'm going to take Africa Risen and I'm going to like dissect that when I'm going to pay attention to it, you know? So I feel like that also comes with being an author, especially indie author, because I feel like in the in the world of authors, in a lot of ways, we are like the self-taught one <laughs> in some sense. So what would be your advice to our listeners who are like, okay, I hear you, what you guys are saying that you have to dissect books, but how do you tell the difference between something you should be paying attention to versus something that's just kind of out there? You know, that's a good question because at the same time, like there is something personal about, you know, there's personal opinions in art, right? Um, You have your personal opinion in it. And then there's kind of like also separated from craft, (laughs) which is also completely different. And I really think one, one of the reasons to read widely and to read your stories is so that you know what resonates with you. You know what Mm -hmm. style resonates with you. You know what you like. Because eventually you'll realize what you like and what you don't like. (laughs) And really tear apart why you like the things that you like. I love that. Oh, So I'm going to throw that out here and I hope I don't hurt any feelings. But um, she's telling you guys to think critically. (laughs) So that means that when you pick up a book, you have to think critically about it. Like what's happening, especially if it's one of those books where you get lost in. Those are the ones that you for sure need to pay attention to. Like what is it about this story that's pulling you into it? That's keeping you engaged? That's keeping you turning pages? That's making you happy what's giving you the serotonin right (laughs) but also if you run into a book and you're like I just can't get into it like examine that like what is it about it that's putting you off you know it is personal but also and I mean some of it is fact but you know we're not going to get into that either (laughs) so not this episode right (laughs) not this episode (laughs) 
So, but I will ask you this, you know, since we are talking about, you know, thinking critically about our writing, how has writing Sister Samurai kind of changed your thought process about like your books and your writing as a whole? Because you're also working on an upcoming anthology, right? Yes, the anthology right now is actually on Kickstarter. It's called The Advent of Winter. And Mm -hmm. if you sign up for the Kickstarter, it will send you a short story in December for each day of Advent. And it's all winter themed. Can you still hear me? Yes, I just had to mute my mic because I was like, oh, let me write this down to make sure that you guys get the link (laughs) to the Kickstarter at the the bottom of this episode or show notes, whatever, where the links are. Y'all know what to to do at this point. Oh, yeah. So I so I have a short story in that upcoming anthology and even writing from short story to novella to a whole novel is completely, completely different because I'm because I'm one of those ones, one of those writers who like to kind of world build throughout the story. But when you have mm-hmm. a short story and you and there's information you have to get to the reader and don't have the space to do so, it's like, OK, what? What what should I put in here? What do I like, what, what do I what do I do? It's and and it is also very helpful to have beta readers and to have people you can go to because sometimes you are so close to the story and you're like I don't know what needs what information needs to be here or not. <laughs> No, that's valid. I, you, you know me, I will be like, oh, by the way, by the way, this person is just going to like, these bones are going to break in. You and Law were both like, no, that's actually not how that's set up. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I was just like, well then. <laughs> so I get what you're saying about like, huh, maybe, maybe I should explain this a little bit more about what I meant. <laughs> Especially when, like you said, it comes to the world building in the short form. Because when you're writing fantasy in short form, it's like, oh, you have to introduce the reader. Like, hey, this is fantasy from like the very first paragraph. Otherwise, they're going to be like, wait a second. How are they doing this? Yeah, yeah. Or even like trying to do like epic fantasy in short form. It seems like a kind of conundrum, right? Because epic fantasy usually is like long form high stakes yes. and it's like how are you gonna do that in a short story <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're gonna save the world in three thousand words or less let's exactly. do it exactly <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know what? i believe brandy could do it she, she could do it i think honestly if jack left brandy alone with all of her problems in a room she absolutely would handle them <laughs> in three thousand words or less she would. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, short story ideas, Jesse. <laughs> <sighs> You're going to have me end the whole series in like 15 pages <laughs> like for the third book. And then she killed everyone. The end. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. So we've kind of touched on this idea of epic fantasy, which brings us to our next topic, which I'm really excited for you guys to talk about because literally when Tatiana and I had this conversation the first time. I was like, do you want to come on the podcast and talk about this? Because this is information that I personally did not have. (laughs) So, um, and that is just basically understanding the different types of genres that are attached to books, especially within the fantasy world. Because as someone who is, I'm not going to say ignorant, because I definitely do my research, but there is a lot of information that is kind of like contradicting that kind of just floats around and then you kind of hear things you see how people use them on like social media at large and you kind of just kind of gravitate after a while and so I was having a conversation with Tatiana she was like you know you actually don't write this and I was like ah! <laughs> what you mean <laughs> and so <clears throat> that kind of brings me to you know the question of you know From your perspective, right, what would you say are like some of the common misconceptions that authors have when they go about picking genres for their books? Sure. And I think I want to start with the question of why these genres are important in the first place. Because I feel as if indie authors, when we come into the indie space, we're like, we can do whatever we want. We can do all these cool, interesting things. What's genre? You know, like, we don't need to. (laughs) Who cares? Who cares? It is what it is. Read the book. Exactly. But the the matter of the fact is, is genre is as important to indie as it is important to trad. It is a marketing tool. And as indies, we can also use that marketing tool. It is, it helps us gain visibility. If you know people are looking for a certain tropes, certain things, 
You can mm-hmm. say, I have this thing that you are looking for, and it helps mm-hmm. people find you. So it is absolutely a tool that indie authors can use and making sure you choose the right genre is important too, because you don't mm-hmm. want to set up your readers for false expectations. They're thinking they're going to get one thing when they read the book and then they get something completely different. So making sure you have the right genre, you know what the genres are, because the fact of the matter is compared to trad publishing, mm-hmm. There's so many genres in indie publishing. <laughs> There's yes. so many smaller genres in indie publishing. Um, you know, and you see some of these smaller genres get bigger and picked up by trad. Like indie really is paving the way for a lot of these smaller genres that eventually might get bigger down the road. But when mm-hmm. you hit this space, there's so many subgenres in fantasy, so many subgenres in romance and paranormal. It's 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 a lot. So it's like, where do I start? How do I know what book you know what book it is? <laughs> where do I go? And as Chelsea said, there is a lot of contradictory information. Mm-hmm. And the reason why there's a lot of contradictory information is because one, you know, because indie tends to be the wild wild west. There is it just it changes so fast. So sometimes the definition of things changes so fast. For example, mm-hmm. taking the um, definitions of classic fantasy and modern fantasy. What we decide what is classic and modern really depends on our perception. You know, when mm-hmm. Lords of the when George R. R. Tolkien was writing Lords of the Rings, his idea of what classic and modern is is completely different than what our idea of classic and modern is. Like for example, we might determine that George R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones, is now classic because a lot of people that come after him, you know, he's influenced a lot of books in the genre now. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when he was writing it just 10, 20 years ago, it might not Mm -hmm. have been considered that. So even, like, these genres and the definition of these genres are constantly changing. (laughs) So that also makes it difficult to kind of keep, like, ahead of, like, what's going on (laughs) in the genre space. No, that makes perfect sense because, like, as soon as you said it, I was just like, oh, yeah, for sure. That's that's definitely classic fantasy at this point, mostly because I feel like at some point when people start referring newer authors like, hey, have you read this? Or they're like, hey, you know, you need to read this book or this series to understand and get like kind of your footing in this genre and understand what people are referring to. I never read Lord of the Rings. I never read Game of Thrones. I don't plan to. That is not on the TBR, to be honest. But it's also one of those things where it's just like, but I acknowledge the impact that it's had on the industry in such a significant way. And I feel like that has to be like one of the defining factors for like what's classic and what's not but it also I feel like kind of shines this light on okay now everything because this thing was so wildly successful in this genre now everything has to be this genre or this genre adjacent in order to kind of like ride the coattails of that one thing's success you know Yeah. And, you know, there is that kind of like well-known mantra of, you know, if you're always chasing the trends, you're never going to be the trend. (laughs) Right. So that also comes with its pros and cons. Like I would really recommend just like write what you're going to write. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like there is that marketability factor to it too. But, you know, like with Sister Samurai, like there is no action fantasy. That genre is still very small. There's no black heroine in it. Like, you know, like there's nothing (laughs) in this right now. Right. Um, So it's not really, it's kind of just taking what trends there are right now and kind of saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do and figuring out how to use the correct words and the correct terminology to market it and to help people find you. But there are a lot of genres. Like, there are a lot of genres. I was even doing research for this podcast yesterday, and it was just like a black hole. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she said a rabbit hole. And I think that's the other thing that's really intimidating about picking a genre. It's just kind of like you want well, you want one, especially if you're indie, right? And I don't know if anyone else has had this experience. So it might just be a me thing. I don't know. But for me, when I was doing my research, one of the things that kind of like came up simultaneously when I was researching it, especially for indie authors is, okay, picking a genre, but also like picking a niche. And they're like, pick a genre where you can also pick keywords on Amazon to like market your book. And so they kind of go hand in hand. And so it's just like, even if you have something very niched down where you're you're like this is exactly what it is it's you know it's a black 
action and sorcery book, right? Ooh, see how many people are searching that <laughs> on Amazon, <laughs> right? And so you're like, I'm going to sell this book to like five people. I have to do a, a broader term. And then also, I think it, it falls into when you're like on Ingram Spark and Tatiana, I'm sure you know this very well. <laughs> But when they're like, hey, what genre is your book? But then they have all these subgenres, but then they don't have what you're looking for in the subgenre to pick. And you're just kind of like, which one of these most closely matches what I'm actually looking for? Like, which is the good broad umbrella term? Right. So. And Ingram Spark uses the, I believe, the BSAC genres, which mm -hmm. are usually the ones that TRAD and the library systems uses. Amazon. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Amazon because Amazon does have a lot of influence into how like indie, some indie genres have been created with their category system and how, you know, books are put into categories. So that actually has influenced a lot of sub genres within the indie space, kind of just like Amazon and their big behemoth of a system. <laughs> For better or for worse, it's influencing the industry. And it's one of those things where it's just like, love it or hate it, it is what it is. That's really how I feel about Ingram Spark as well. Love it or hate it, like it, it is what it is. And it's kind of a necessary evil, especially for indie authors. But I feel like that's a whole other conversation that we could definitely have on Ingram Spark alone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but let's, um, just to go into some definition of some very general s s fantasy genres so that, you know, kind yes. of people watching kind of know what to expect when they're, when they're writing. So I was going to ask you, so please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of subgenres, but I think sometimes when we look at books, it's dependent mm -hmm. on what we're looking for. And what we're mm -hmm. looking for can sometimes either be plot stakes, it can be mm -hmm. settings, it can be certain tropes. So right. for example... A lot of these things exist on a spectrum. So this never either black or white is this or is this. Sometimes it can be like in the middle of the spectrum. Sometimes it can be kind of over here. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we're looking at a epic fan, when we're looking at a fantasy in regards to stakes, mm -hmm. um, the books with the highest stakes, those tend to be our epic fantasies. The, you know, yeah. save the world, the defeat, defeat evil. And mm -hmm. As I was speaking with um, Chelsea, like those books tend to be long because it usually takes a long time to wrap up such high stakes. But there yes. are absolutely that I've read some standalone epic fantasies that do a great job of kind of just, you know, solving those stakes within one book, which is <laughs> impressive yeah. and hard. But hmm. they, they some managed some managed to do it. And I would consider them epic fantasy. So those ones with like really world ending stakes. But then you mm -hmm. get the genres with lower stakes, and those, and that's called usually sword sorcery. So those are really like personal stakes. Um, so mm -hmm. for example, in mom duology, the personal stakes here is it's a coming of age competition. So whether mm -hmm. you become an adult or not, like that is the personal stakes in in that story. Um, so that's what makes it much smaller, <laughs> much smaller than like a, the world is ending um, for example right. in your books Chelsea where you have like the universe on the line <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> big and epic <laughs> yeah. it's like do this or we're going to destroy everyone and kill it everything okay yeah that sounds great <laughs> yeah and then when we talk about stakes there's another subgenre that has like come and snuck in which is cozy fantasy like cozy fantasy yeah. is actually on the way like it's taken sword and sorcery's lower stakes and way on the other side now to where there's basically yeah. kind of no stakes like cozy mm -hmm. fantasy you're not worried anyone's gonna die or be nope. mutilated brutally you're just like okay i'm just gonna get like a nice little plot it's gonna be you know like you're not mm -hmm. expecting maybe someone's lost something or they're you know as we say um, legends and latte travis baltry he's he's mm -hmm. really big in this genre trap picked him up from the indie from the indie community and kind of really catapulted cozy fantasy into the mainstream and, yeah. and, you know, that story is about an orc building a tea shop, a coffee shop. Yep. And that's it. That's, that's the story. <laughs> but no, that's, that's again, one of those things where it's just like self-published and indie publishing really sets the trend for trap publishing. Because um, when you said it, I immediately went to like Kimberly Lemming. And it's just like her series where it's just like homegirl is literally just like trying to, it's, it's an adventure. It's very, it's very systematic, but it's fun. And it's the stakes 
super low, super low. And it made me think about how, like, you know, there's that phrase, it's like, it's not the destination, it's the journey type thing. I feel like cozy fantasy is very much like, there is no destination, it's just the journey. (laughs) Right. You know? And sometimes those, um, there's also slice of life fantasy. It's very, Mm -hmm. I don't really see it at all in the trad space Mm -hmm. but it does exist in the indie space slice of life where it's just like you've read you've you've watched like slice of life anime we're just following people's life and their like (laughs) travails and life and like that's all it is that is it um literally as soon as you said it i was like oh like that anime was like i spent 300 years killing slimes and now i'm a super powerful witch or something like that that's literally i want to say like the name of it ben probably knows better than i do but it's literally about this girl who got reincarnated as a witch and she just spent 300 years killing slimes because she didn't want to get hurt and then her day-to-day life being a super powerful witch yeah but and then tried. Those are like when you look at the genre from a, from the stakes and the plot side, but mm-hmm. then there's also like high fantasy and low fantasy, and that's when yes. you're looking at magical elements in a story. So high mm-hmm. fantasy is usually complex magic system. You have might have like different races, elves, dwarves, mm-hmm. like all these different magical things. Low right. fantasy is could very well be like a completely different world, but very little. There's very little fantasy in it. It mm-hmm. might be hinted at. I would, I would categorize the first Game of Thrones book as low fantasy. It's basically basically just politics, and you're like, oh yeah, there's zombies up there at the wall somewhere. We don't. <laughs> most people don't believe in them. There's some it's magic. What? What is that? Let's keep <laughs> killing each other. <laughs> so that's a, that's an example of like the difference between high fantasy and low fantasy, and where people get a lot confused is. You can be, these genres cross. So you can be an epic fantasy and Mm -hmm. a high fantasy. You can Mm -hmm. have a book with very big stakes and a lot of magical elements. Or you can have a book with very big stakes and basically little magical elements. So some Mm -hmm. of these genres, you absolutely can be both. (laughs) And I think that's the other thing where, as an indie author, especially in the beginning, I myself got like tripped up because I was just like, what is the difference? Because I was literally like, what is the difference between an epic fantasy and a high fantasy? And then I figured out that it's exactly what you said. High fantasy is like, it you create everything. Like there's a lot of magic. It's a lot of world building. That like that heavy world building. Like when you think like, I'll say like El Penelope or N.K. Jemison or those yeah. authors who have really heavy world building yeah. in their stories. Yeah, that's high fantasy, right? That means that everything is like self-contained. I think, okay. Or like if you watched any type of, TV in the early 2000s, right? It's kind of like Avatar Last Airbender. Everything within Avatar is self-contained. The the world, the divisions, the hierarchy, the politics, all of it is self-contained. That's high fantasy, right? But then you have the opposite, low fantasy, which I think also, you can let me know if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. I, that also gets classified as like urban fantasy a lot because it's just like, or magical realism, Right. Because especially if your low fantasy isn't set, low fantasy is like still another world, but low magic. But then urban fantasy, magical realism, I feel like people use those kind of interchangeably because it's like magic in the real world. Yeah. So so that's definitely one where things can be both, because Mm -hmm. if we're looking at how how many magical elements does a story contain, there's definitely is low fantasy, very small. Then there's magical, like there's surrealism to where you're mm-hmm. kind of in the real world, but the it's it's kind of mysticism, right? You're like the magic is not explained. It's not. It it could be there. Some people believe it. Some people don't. And mm-hmm. as you said, urban fantasy, there are definitely coming from the genres with stakes the genres with with magical elements and there's the genres with settings <laughs> because the reason I think the reason why all these things get divided into genres is because so many people start writing in these genres then there's our there are expected tropes within these genres that are, yes. that is connected with whatever this specific thing is so for example the settings is yes a fantasy set in a city is typically urban mm-hmm. fantasy and if there's not much fantasy in it you can call it low fantasy so it could absolutely be both Mm -hmm. um other things that are kind of based off of setting is um uh, there's 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 urban fantasy which is based off of in a city 
There's another one, too. Let me look my notes. <laughs> <laughs> she came prepared, you guys. But while she's looking up her notes, I'm going to point out that I, Bing came in with the anime that I was talking about. And it's called I've Been Killing Slimes for 300 Years and Maxed Out My Level. So if you're interested, Slice of Life. There it is. And then Audra also pointed out that um, if you're listening to this and you're getting overwhelmed with all the subgenres, there are a lot of subgenres and you are not the only one who can't handle it because I'm I'm literally sitting here and I am like knee deep in this industry and I'm just like, there are so many, <laughs> there's so many ways to go with this. But I also, I'm going to let Tatiana finish, but I also kind of feel like you don't have to apply every genre that's applicable to your story. It's just like pick the ones that you feel are going to help you market your book the best. So if you like talking about if your book can, like she said, it can be low fantasy and urban fantasy. If you feel like low fantasy is going to like help sell your book in a market where people are like, oh, I'm so tired of, you know, having so much world building or heavy world building or like, I can't imagine this. I just want yada, yada, yada. Then you could be like, hey, my book is a low fantasy, da, 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 da. Versus, you know, if someone's like, oh, I want more urban fantasy. You're like, oh, that fits me as well. I'm going to go here. I think it's about picking the right one versus being like, oh, I'm going to apply <laughs> every subgenre that applies <laughs> to my book. Yes. And um, and as I said before, there tends to, as the genres grow, there tends to be tropes that are associated with that genre. So think, think about what people would expect of it. If you're marking as an urban fantasy, are you going to give them what they expect? If you're marking yeah. as a low fantasy, you're going to give them what they expect. So, for example, in low fantasy, you typically have more political intrigue, more mm -hmm. politics is the conflict. Urban fantasy, you know, there are tropes very specifically dedicated to urban fantasy that people kind of expect, mm -hmm. you know, certain things that happen within the city. Um, if you're in a modern day contemporary city, you know, sometimes you like to see like real places or real historical places that mm -hmm. were actually there. But yes, yeah, so urban fantasy is one of those like setting genres. And there are mm -hmm. other setting genres that I kind of identified. So, for example, secondary world fantasy. We talk about a lot of this in fantasy, which is just like a completely separate world from our own, right? Like yep. it's just completely made up, as you said, like N.K. Jemisin, just all of the epics, right? And then there is contemporary fantasy. So contemporary mm -hmm. fantasy is fantasy that happens in our everyday. So, for, for example, like Legendborn um, mm -hmm. that happens in contemporary times. There's other... Like there's hidden world fantasy, basically kind of like Harry Potter, where there's a world on top of our everyday world and like yeah. part of it's hidden and you kind of have access it, access to it, depending mm -hmm. on who you are or, or what your advantages are. There's also portal fantasy, which is, you know, from this world to another world, <laughs> <It's a> completely <laughs> different, completely different world. So there are, and for each one of these genres, there are tropes associated with that. So look at the tropes that are in your book and see which genre that it matches and it's closely aligned to. Exactly. I definitely agree with that. And also, if you're listening to this and you've heard us say the word trope a million times, we're just kind of assuming that if you're this deep in the conversation, you know what we're talking about. But in case you're not, tropes are those commonly accepted norms for the book. So if you're writing a romance, the, the trope for... A romance might be, oh, the one bed trope, where basically you have two characters who are proximity. They're forced together because they have to spend the night somewhere, but there's only one bed. That is that is a trope. People know what it is. People expect it. And for certain genres, especially when you get knee deep into it, people start looking for certain tropes to kind of like satisfy a certain craving. I know that within the romance community, book community, that is huge, like looking for books based off of certain tropes. I'm not going to get into it because the romance community scares me. Y'all know this about me. <laughs> I just kind of stay on the fringes and be like, wow, that's what y'all are doing over there. I'm going to stay over here. <laughs> it's not my bag. <laughs> but let's talk about let, let's talk about romance fantasy for a bit because it oh is a huge part <laughs> of the indie space and a huge part of the indie fantasy space. Um, because very recently, there's been conversations in regards to different genres in this space. There is now fantasy romance and romantic fantasy. And I, I remember when I first heard it, I was like, 
it's not the same thing. <laughs> That's not the same thing. <laughs> Apparently, whichever one you put first is where the emphasis of the story is. So if it's a fantasy romance, it's a fantasy book with romance elements. If it's a romantic fantasy, it's a romance with fant- set in a fantasy world with fantasy elements. See, I have the opposite. Okay, see, <laughs> everybody's just making up what they want to do. I don't... Because yeah. I was also like romanticy. What is that? So, Apparently, so, it's a romantic fantasy. Yeah. So, from what I understand, romanticy is is just the the abbreviation of romantic fantasy. And I had to do some research about this too because I'm also not big into the romance space, but I know a lot of your listeners might be. So this is kind of from what I ascertained that fantasy romance is a romance set in a fantasy world. That it's primarily romance. The background drop is fantasy. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then there's romantic fantasy to where is a romantic fantasy story set in in a fantasy story but with also a subplot. So it's like 50-50. It's equal. You can't really have one without the other. If you take one so, away, it either breaks apart. Okay, okay. So follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If I have a cup and I fill it up halfway. Yes. It doesn't matter which part has water in it and which part has air because it's still 50%, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So oh, romantic okay. fantasy is about 50-50. And then you have fantasy with romantic subplots, and that's obviously more fantasy. You're <laughs> like, more, like, 80% fantasy, 20% romance. Okay, here's where I start to get kind of irritated, right? Because I'm just kind of like, I feel like with so much subgenring and, th- like, that aspect of first of all, I'm probably going to make someone upset. If I do, I take full responsibility for that. That's stupid. It, it, it it's it, fantasy romance, romantic. Fa- it's a fantasy with romance. Well, That's what it is. <laughs> but then, I, yeah, yeah, I do get the logic a little bit, Chelsea, because it's the 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 genre has grown so big. It is there's so many books in this genre. So people going in is they're basically like, well, how much romance is in the book? I want little romance, or do you want a lot of romance? And this helps them know which levels of romance that they're getting. And see, I would argue that it really doesn't be, just because even within the two of us, with the research that we've done, we've gotten completely different definitions. And so if we're marketing it, and we're being like, hey, this is a fantasy romance, but it's really a romantic fantasy, it's like if we, who have done research, can't agree on what the term is, how are we supposed to expect readers to know what that term is? And I also feel like, to a certain extent, it takes away the actual... I don't want to say it, it takes away from the art that is writing because the thing is, when you have a good story, it's going to have multiple layers to it. So if you're writing a fantasy romance, and for the sake of argument, because honestly, I'm confused at this point, but for the sake of argument for this example, right? Say a fantasy romance is, you know, a romance story set in a fantasy world, but it's primarily focusing on the romance, right? It's like, okay, but I feel like to a certain extent, like trying to figure out which one is more important is taking away from the fact that you've written a story that contains both of these things. And I think that also comes down to marketing a book more so than focusing on what's in the book sometimes, because it's like, I get it. You have to market the book. That is like the crux of being successful as an author, especially as an indie author. But also it's like, hey, if you're looking for a romance and you wrote a romance, it's set in a fantasy world, but this is a romantic story, then market it to romance readers versus trying to market it to fantasy readers. I feel like that's a decision that should be made after the book is written versus trying to be like, oh, it fits this subgenre, but these words are flipped. Therefore, it is something completely different. I feel like it it gets convoluted to a point where it's just like, okay, you get to the point where you just kind of want to ask people, but okay, what is it? And I feel like if we niche down in the genres so heavily that we're like, okay, these words mean nothing to me anymore, what's in the book, then we've kind of defeated the purpose of giving it a genre in the first place. Yeah. You know? But also, you know, when we talk about, I guess, genre, because we're like living this right now. Like, you know, like these divisions are happening right now. And sometimes I think it takes, time for things to kind of shake out and mm-hmm. kind of solidify to what they are um so yeah we definitely are in the oh, i don't know what this is 
But I do think after a couple of years, we might, we, we will start to see some like hard line, like definitions. Or, you know, if these marketing, if these genres aren't being useful to the authors, aren't being useful to the readers, helping them find them, I've seen subgenres just going, you know, being left by the wayside because they're simply mm-hmm. not useful anymore. That's true. And I guess we just have to see it play out. Because like I said, I'm not in the romance game. I don't plan to get into the romance game. That's not my bag. And I know romance specifically has some of the more difficult genreing because people within when they go into a romance novel or a romance book, there are certain elements that they are looking for. Because I've even seen the argument where people are like certain tropes should be a genre. So if it's a, you know, a happily ever after versus like a third act breakup, those need to be separate genres for people and I'm kind of like but that's part of the nature of writing a romance novel and I and so I guess there's part of me like as a reader that's like oh I would love to know exactly what I'm getting into when I pick up a book but then there's also the part of me like as an author where I'm just like okay but you know there's that advice whether you take it or leave it you know good or bad whatever I'm not passing judgment but there's that device where it's like when you start writing your book know what genre you're writing from the very beginning that way you can write to your audience to a certain extent, or at least on your, you know, second draft or whatever, when you're actually refining it. But it's just like, if the the genres are so convoluted <laughs> to that point, you know, it, I feel like that as an author takes away some of the enjoyment and joy of writing the story, especially when I'll say like you and I, we're writing things outside of a certain set genre. And it's just kind of like, okay, but if I'm trying to write to, to the audience and the audience specifically wants, let's say they want a, like a dark fantasy, like that is what they want. And it's just like, OK, but my like I know my story and your story because they touch on, I don't want to say graphic things, but like they touch on heavy topics that can be considered darker, the darker side of fantasy that doesn't necessarily make it a dark fantasy, but that doesn't mean that we should change what the book is in order to cater to that yeah you know yeah I definitely write what I want to write but I use genre as a marketing tool to kind of get my to 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 position my books to find their right audience um and Mm -hmm. like just even in that that short conversation of yours Chelsea like I had like a lot of a lot of thoughts (laughs) (laughs) this is why I love Tatiana y'all she is absolutely that person to be like I hear you but hear me out (laughs) So like there's also something that we because there's there's some genres that are definitely more mature than others. One of mm-hmm. the genres you mentioned is when we look at it by age, new adults. Trash yes. does not recognize new adults. They Here don't. In, the indie space uses new adult as kind of like this space between 20 for 20 year olds and 30 year olds that doesn't really exist. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. like having some genres to like to to kind of define some of Trad's absences and Trad's holes can be beneficial Mm -hmm. um but to your you know I guess to your like kind of coziness there's there's something that like you begin to notice like over time with reading taste and with over time with reading genres and that's kind of world events usually Mm -hmm. when you know like the world is comfortable and things are okay you see a lot more people enjoying grimmer darker books yeah but when things are like terrible like the pandemic you see people like going towards romantic because they know how things are going to end you see people yeah. going towards cozy um, and that's safe yeah because it's safe like i so i'm not i was not at all shocked when cozy blew up like in these past <laughs> couple of years at all and so you mm, and so know. there's also the thing of how world events kind of influence genre and there's t- <laughs> and there's also <laughs> two uh, i'm sorry i'm laughing at audrey saying tatiana has the pen in her hand. <laughs> look i saw you i was like she was over here taking notes ready <laughs> Yeah, and as we were talking about romance, I was thinking about how there are other two, there's two other genres in the fantasy, I feel like, community that are also in contention at the moment Mm -hmm. as well and haven't really solidified. And that's, one is lit RPG and progression fantasy. Have you heard them? Do you know what they are? Baby, I'm looking at you like, what is that? That is a new one on me. (laughs) All right. So progression fantasy really was kind of, catapulted into mainstream with Will White um, novels like Cradle and mm-hmm. and then Lit RPG like this is really influenced by video games so you have books that have video game elements in it kind of like Sword, Sword Art Online on the mm-hmm. anime there's books yeah. like that now 
And so oh, those okay. books tend to be called like lit RPG because there there's very specific video game elements. The characters have stats. They're leveling up. Um, you know what? I, I I'm not even mad about that. I am now intrigued, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yes. And there's also progression fantasy, which can be lit RPG, but it can also not have those elements. So the way to explain it is, you know how in anime there are certain characters whose goal, whose plot goal is to better themselves and to get better, Mm -hmm. right? You know, like Goku's like, yeah, "Yeah, Frieza, please go to third form because I just want to see if I can beat you. (laughs) This is a terrible idea, but yes, encourage the villain. So that's where a, that's where progression fantasy inspired. Where you know we have epic fantasy where the stakes is very high. There's progression mm-hmm. fantasy where the stakes is very personal, is personal and sometimes physical growth. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes that growth can be through video game elements. Sometimes it can be through like kind of like kung fu tropes, kung fu elements. And you see a lot of those books out. But the, that genre is also very new. And you see, like, a lot of contention. Like, what is the difference between these two playing out today as well? And then wow. the other <laughs> the other genre that's kind of interesting to follow is dark fantasy. So... Mm-hmm. Now, that one I have seen kind of be up in the air recently. Yeah. So, so in order to really talk about dark fantasy, I need to kind of go back to grim dark. So... Okay. Grimdark kind of came as a contention, as kind of started as comparison to like epic fantasy, high fantasy, very heroic fantasy, right? And Grimdark is like, okay, more realistic, like morally great characters, like people are real, people are terrible, etc. Like that's Mm -hmm. Grimdark. And I actually really enjoy this genre. But as we've kind of seen throughout the history of Grimdark is that it's gotten darker and darker and darker and darker to where Mm -hmm. sometimes it's so dark it's unrealistic yeah and i now people have kind of put that 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 farther in into its own genre and now people have decided there's a middle called dark fantasy to where it's kind of yeah it's a little bit more realistic to where the the dark elements and the light elements balance a little bit better because mm-hmm. before, you'll see, oh, what's dark fantasy? People will say, oh, it's fantasy with horror elements. So right. you suddenly see, like, this shifting in the genre. I don't, I don't know why, but, but that's also another genre that people are like, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know. <sighs> and that's really interesting because, like, you know, for me personally, with the story that I'm working on with the necromancer, it was like, oh, obviously it's going to be, like, dark fantasy. That's what was told to me. And I was just like... Is it, though? Because, like, I mean, morally great characters, yes, because I don't know how to write. One thing I'm never going to write is a Deku character. And if you don't know who Deku is, it's My Hero Academia. And all you need to know is that he's the type of character where he does the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing, no matter how badly he's about to come to death. He's just like, the right thing is the right thing. And I'm just like, oh, that makes me upset. I am never going to write a character like like that. Right? And so... But it's just, like, this idea that, like, oh, if you're murking people, now you have dark fantasy because you're adding in elements of murder. And I'm like, but is it, though? Because I feel like the rest of it's kind of, like, light or whatever. And so there's always this 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 idea, like you said, of, like, okay, it's on the spectrum. It's, yeah. It falls into, like, what is it, really? Yeah. And so yeah. it's it's interesting because, like you said, at the end of the day... All of these genres are tools because I was looking at the comments and, you know, Lash is talking about, you know, it's re- making her rethink so many things. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you kind of have to remember, like, as you do your research and you are picking out your genres to remember that it is a tool at the end of the day. And if you don't know how to use the tool, if you're not <laughs> if you're not sure if this is the right tool for the job, don't use it. Just pick one that, you know, for sure is going to work, because at the end of the day, if you say your book is a ro- is a romance. OK, that that is still an accurate tool, even if you can't sub niche it down all the way to this is a, you know, polyamorous alien slash centaur <laughs> monster romance I mean, monster set romance in an alternate is world. It is monster a thing romance now. <laughs> is a thing, but it's also one of those things where it's like, I feel like at the end of the day, you know, actionable advice for our listeners, right, is sit down with your book and be like, my book is this, this, and that. 
And take those three things and like hone in on them as best you can to be like, okay, so now where does my book, where do these three things fit into the genres of my book? So if you're like, um, for me, right, with We Are the Origin, it's like, okay, I have a book about black assassins who are saving the world, saving the world, high stakes. Okay, this is an epic fantasy. Black assassins who are killing people. Okay, well, this might might be a dark fantasy, right? So it's like, okay, now I have my genres. It's it's an epic dark fantasy. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. There I, you go. I act, that's actually exactly how I would categorize it. <laughs> <laughs> like, if we're talking about, like, now. Because sometimes, like, the way that I remember these genres is, is they're often in reaction to things, right? Yes. Like, dark fantasy, these these you know, these things killing, you know, like killing people, why people make a big huff about it is because our classic fantasy, our modern fantasy comes from more heroic archetypes. Yes. Um, And so it's all of that subverting, subverting what came before. (laughs) I'm sorry, I read the chat. (laughs) If you, okay, so if you're listening to this, Ash came in and she was like, I mean, I feel like you have something against the monster copulating <laughs> community in the audience. And I want y'all to be, be clear. I have nothing against it. Okay. I don't. That is, I, when I tell you, I do not foray into romance at this point in my life. Y'all scare me. Not and at so all. I just, like, I know just, your genre and go for it. <laughs> go for it. I'm just very heavily grounded in fantasy like <laughs> that's it that's it monster romance love you guys appreciate you guys if you're listening to the podcast i i i i, I am on the outside looking in i am yeah. not in the game can't pit me in coach <laughs> yeah you know for the readers if they are confused about their genres like go go read like if you're like what's paranormal you know like as you were saying what's fantasy romance or romantic fantasy go read what people say they are and mm-hmm. like see the what the difference is and see if yours match that or see what you know how they do like this book has these tropes these book has these tropes and we know that monster romance has like romance with a monster like that's very right. obvious on the tin but you're like okay my book has monster with the romance there we go right and then also kind of live in what you're I would say not live but kind of know what your book isn't as well so that you don't get pulled into marketing your book a certain way because I know for we are the origin when I was marketing it the first time people are like oh my god is this it's a new fantasy romance I was like it is not a fantasy romance do not put that on me do not come here for the romance it is not in it yeah don't do that and it's, it, it is very hard as an indie romance and sometimes I'm sorry as an indie author and sometimes the readers know more than you. They, yeah. they do. Like with my book, I didn't really know how to market it when I first published it because it's a lot of things. And I was just watching the reviews come in. I'm like, that's what, it, okay, let me, let me take notes. I'm like, okay, that's what they're saying. Let me take notes. Sometimes just take notes. And the readers, they, they read hundreds of these books and yeah. like pay attention to what they're saying. Absolutely. Um, because I think my book got comped a couple of times to N.K. Jemison's 100,000 Kingdoms. And I just I just ran with it. I did not actually read the book until much later. And I was like, oh, OK, I see what you guys are talking about. But but that being said, I feel like this is a conversation that we could definitely continue on for a while because there is so much nuance that comes to picking a genre for your book and trying to like market it. So if you guys are interested in talking to me about it, I can't say nothing about Tatiana because she's a busy woman. She got things to do. But if you're interested in talking to me about it, then uh, y'all know that I offer mentoring services so you can book an hour with me to, we can figure it out together, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, Tatiana, we are going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. So I have a couple more questions for you. Um, the first one being what right Writing advice would you give to any new authors just starting out on their writing journey? Ooh, writing advice. Um, write, write what you're passionate about. Like, you know, especially when you first start out, disregard the genres, like dis- disregard what's hot, disregard what's trending, like write, write what's in your heart, write what you're passionate about, because I can bet you that there's someone else out there that is as passionate about it as you are. I mean, that's how the trends and the genres start start you know like people who are passionate about it finding each other yes I would definitely second that and also remember that if you see a trend by the time you start writing to the trend the trend's already over 
that's just kind of the reality. But unless you can write a book in a day, if you can write, market, and sell a book in a day, baby, go ahead and do your thing. <laughs> but assuming that it takes you any amount of time, you know, if you're like, oh, the trend right now is like vampires, right? Like, okay, cool. But by the time you actually write that vampire book and you actually do everything, it's going to be like next year sometime, which the trend may be over or you're going to be on the tail end of it. And people are going to be chasing another trend. But if you write what you're passionate about, if you're writing vampires because you love vampires, you're still going to have that passion even after the trend comes and goes. And you'll be able to be consistent with it and show up for your work in a way that you wouldn't be able to if you were just trying to chase the clout. So that being said, um, what is up next for you? Other than trying to get this book out by November 1st. <laughs> Again, the ebook and paperback comes out November 1st. The hardcover comes out December 1st. Those pre order links will be up. So... And I will definitely be getting one. Please know <laughs> that you will see Sister Samurai behind me on this shelf somewhere as soon as I get the hardcover. Don't play with me, y'all. Don't play with me. Okay, continue. Continue. Yeah. Other than beyond beyond that, um, take a break, enjoy the holidays, and then I'll figure out figure out the rest after that. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So you guys, like I said, there will be links to everything in the description, in the show notes, you know, in the places. So please make sure that you pre-order Sister Samurai. I promise you it is a novella that is so, so good, especially if you love, if you love any type of anime, definitely Afro Samurai, or it also reminded me of like Samurai Shampoo. So like, if you love anime, and you love black people, please get the book. Okay, and if you're not on, if you don't love those two things, I'm not sure how you got to this platform, but <laughs> get it, check it out. So we support black authors around here. So there'll be links and yeah, um, please let the people know where to find you. This is your two minutes to shine, ma'am. Oh, well, you can find me at my website, www.tatianaob.com, spelled O-B-E-Y, pronounced O-B. And I'm also in all the social media places, Twitter, Instagram. Oh, sorry, X, Instagram, <laughs> Blue Twitter. Sky. We call it, we call it <laughs> what they mama named them, okay? It's Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, like, black from black Twitter to black X, there's just no, like, it's just a, no, no ring to it. Like, there's no just, ring. Exactly. <laughs> so you can find me all those at a play on my name, Obey the Author. That is my ha social media handle everywhere. <laughs> All right. So you guys heard that. I will make sure that it's all linked down there below so you can go to her website, get her book, all that good stuff. And yeah, that is it for this episode of the Written Melanin Podcast, you guys. If you like to support this podcast, then please share it with someone that you think may enjoy it. Join my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash written in melanin or grab a copy of my books, We Are the Origin and We Are Dying Gods from my website, cmlockhart.com. If you like to support Tatiana, then please purchase her books and follow her on social media. There are links in the show notes for everything. And thank you guys again for listening. So until next time, you guys, I hope all your books are full of melanin. Bye, you guys.